Zechariah 3. Then the angel showed me Jeshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord. The accuser, Satan, was there at the angel's right hand, making accusations against Jeshua. And the Lord said to Satan, I, the Lord, reject your accusation, Satan. Yes, the Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebukes you. This man is like a burning stick that has been snatched from the fire. Jeshua's clothing were filthy as he stood there before the angel. So the angel said to the other standing there, Take off his filthy clothes. And turning to Jeshua, he said, See, I have taken away your sins, and now I am giving you these fine new clothes. Then I said, They should also place a clean turban on his head. So they put a clean priestly turban on his head and dressed him in new clothes while the angel of the Lord stood by. Then the angel of the Lord spoke very solemnly to Jeshua and said, This is what the Lord of heaven's army says. If you follow my ways and carefully serve me, then you will be given authority over my temple and its courtyards. I will let you walk among these others standing here. Listen to me, O Jeshua the high priest, and all you other priests. You are symbols of things to come. Soon I am going to bring my servant the branch. Now look at the jewel I have set before Jeshua, a single stone with seven facets. I will engrave an inscription on it, says the Lord of heaven's armies. And I will remove the sins of this land in a single day. And on that day, says the Lord of heaven's armies, each of you will invite your neighbor to sit with you peacefully under your own grapevine and fig tree. I'm going to read you something from uh, the June 1st Persecution and Prayer Alert from Voice of the Martyrs. If you don't know what Voice of the Martyrs is, it's an organization that helps Christians hear stories about people around the world who are suffering for Christ either being killed for their faith or just suffering in different ways so that we can pray effectively for them. And this is one of the the things that was in there. It says six Libyans may face the death penalty for converting to Christianity and encouraging others to do the same. Believers, these two, these six believers were charged under Article 207 of the Penal Code, which punishes any attempt to spread views that aim to alter the fundamental constitutional principles or the fundamental structures of the society order, or to overthrow the state and anyone who possesses books, leaflets, drawings, slogans, or any other items that promote their cause. Now, in addition, according to the interim constitution of Libya, all religions in the country are guaranteed the freedom to practice their religion. So that sounds kind of contradictory. What these six people need is a good defense lawyer. There. A good defense lawyer will address the law and shows the court that the accused are not guilty. The lawyer needs to show clearly why the person should be declared innocent and set free. And something like that would certainly help these six people. Now, Jesus is just such a lawyer for his people, for us. And the thing is, we are actually all guilty. But he he is still our defense lawyer. But Jesus takes care of our guilt for us. He takes care of it before God and he defends his people from accusations, just like he did with uh, the priest here today. He does it for us right now and he did it for the high priest, Jeshua, in Zechariah 3 today. Now, who is Jeshua? He is the high priest of the people of Israel, which makes him a major leader for the nation. He, along with a guy named Zerubbabel, Zerubbabel is the governor, and many Jewish people came back to Israel after being held captive in Babylon. And once they were back, they started rebuilding the country and the capital city, Jerusalem. And most importantly, they were rebuilding the temple. And that's what they're in the middle of right now. So the prophet Zechariah is receiving a series of six visions from the Lord. And he's giving them to the people of Israel. And this one in particular, he's giving to Jeshua, the the high priest. This is the fourth vision. So we have the vision there of the accuser. There we are. And we also see the angel of the Lord. We'll go to verse 1. This is annoying when this doesn't change. There we go. Then the angel showed me Jeshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord. The accuser, Satan, was there at the angel's right hand, making accusations against Jeshua. So there's three persons listed there. 
And we already know who Jeshua is. I just told you about him. And he was standing before the angel of the Lord. Now, there's a number of places in the Old Testament where we have someone called the angel of the Lord. And at the same time, we see that not only is he called the angel of the Lord, but we see that that person is also identified as God as well. And three weeks ago, I gave you some examples of those things. So if you need some scriptures of those, I can give them to you. But uh, I'm not going to list them here this week because uh, we also hit this about three weeks ago. It's understood that these are also examples of places and times where Jesus himself is appearing to people in the Old Testament. And as we see what happens here, it's obvious that this one, this occasion, is also one of those occasions where it's actually Jesus. So Jeshua is actually standing before Jesus in this vision. Now, the people at that time that Zechariah is talking to would have no idea about Jesus. But they did know that the angel of the Lord was being mentioned in a number of places in the Old Testament. They were familiar with that. For us, we have the completed Old Testament and New Testament, and we understand who Jesus is and what he did, so we can better understand what's happening here. We can see it, whereas at that point, they couldn't see it. The third person listed says it's the accuser, Satan. Now, that term, just that name, Satan, is actually Hebrew taken into English. The, the Hebrew is literally Satan, Satan, and it's a Hebrew noun that's a title which means accuser and adversary, but it's also this being's name, Satan. And the title tells you what he's like. He's an adversary who accuses. Now we understand through the Bible that this person is an angel, a spiritual being that was created perfect by God, but then who rebelled against God and became God's enemy. Satan hates God and hates everything that God loves, which means people are his primary target, like we see here today. When God's people sin, when we sin even, or even when we don't, people like Job, he accuses us before God. And we'll see that in the book of Job. You see that in Revelation 12, where Satan is called the accuser of the brethren. Now, what exactly the accusations that he's bringing, we're not really told. But we'll see in verse 3, the accusations had merit. Uh, but just the same, the defense lawyer will deal with it. Jesus defends. And verse 2 we come to. And the Lord said to Satan, I, the Lord, reject your accusations, Satan. Yes, the Lord, who has chosen Jerusalem, rebukes you. This man is like a burning stick that has been snatched from the fire. So the defense has been made, the verdict is in, and the charges are thrown out. That's a pretty effective defense lawyer. This is the angel of the Lord speaking. This is Jesus speaking here. The reason Jesus gives for the accusations being rejected, he said, is that Jeshua is like a burning stick. Snatched out of the fire. Well, what, what does that mean? Well, if you think about it, a stick that's in a campfire can't get itself out of the fire. Something has to grab it and pull it out by an outside force. And that's key here. Jeshua has been rescued from the fire. The stick has been rescued from destruction, from basically being burned up completely. But it still has the black soot on it. It still has the smell of smoke on it. It needs cleansing as well. And Jesus does it. Jesus takes away sin. He makes clean. And we're given now um, how and why Jesus, as the defense attorney, could reject Satan's accusations in verses 3 to 5. Jeshua's clothing, it says, there was filthy and as he stood before the angel. So the angel uh, said to the other standing there, there we go, take off his filthy clothes. And turning to Jeshua, he said, see, I have taken away your sins. And now I'm giving you these fine new clothes. And then I said, they should also place a clean turban on his head. So they put a clean priestly turban on his head and dressed him in new clothes while the angel of the Lord stood by. Now Jesus firstly removes the filthy clothes. Now the Hebrew word here is really, really vivid. I mean, it means really filthy. Uh, basically human poop filthy, like he's smeared in it. You can think of how disgusting that would be. 
The filthy clothes obviously represent sin because Jesus says, I have taken away your sin. He says that when he takes away the dirty clothes. Now, Jeshua is the high priest, the one you would think least likely to be filthy with sin before God. But the thing is, that's every single human situation. It doesn't matter what you are religiously. Every one of us, God is so holy, so pure, that our wrongdoings, which we often don't think much of, are that filthy before him. Isaiah 64, 6 says, We are all infected and impure with sin. When we display our righteous deeds, there are nothing but filthy rags. Like autumn leaves, we wither and fall, and our sins sweep us away like wind. Now, it's extremely significant that it's the angel of the Lord, it's Jesus, who takes away the sins of Jeshua. Because, of course, it's Jesus who takes the initiative and does this for Jeshua here and for the world when he comes and dies on the cross and is raised three days later. Jesus, as the Son of God, came and lived a perfect life that we couldn't live. And then he died on the cross, letting himself be punished by God for our sins in our place. This is, this is when Jesus ultimately interceded with God as our lawyer, having our sin placed in his account like he was the one who was guilty, like he was the one owing it. And then he died paying the penalty for us. And then three days later, Jesus rose, showing the payment was done and God's justice was satisfied. When we realize our filthy condition of sin before God and confess it to him and turn from it and put our trust in the death of Jesus for us, asking him for forgiveness, he does it. And if you've never done that, I invite you to simply by praying, telling God of your sin and sorrow for it and asking him to forgive you through Jesus and committing yourself to follow him the rest of your life. And of course, you can talk to me about that any time. When we do that, God forgives us and takes out of our account what we owe, our guilt, and puts in our account the perfect sinless life that Jesus lived, just like we had lived it. And the Bible calls this the righteousness of Jesus. God counts our life to be lived like Jesus lived his. 2 Corinthians 5.21 For our sake, he became, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And that describes just what I was saying there. The righteousness of Jesus is the fine new clothes and the clean turban that he gives us. When he says, see, I have taken away your sin, and now I'm giving you fine new clothes. Like he says to Zechariah in verse 4. That is pretty incredible when you think about it. That basically we know we aren't righteous like Jesus is. But Jesus takes away our sin and gives us his own righteousness so that we can stand before God literally clothed in the righteousness of Jesus and be perfect before him. That is crazy. That is incredible. That is God's love and his provision for us through Jesus. Now we know that even when we are become a follower of Jesus and we are forgiven in that way, that we are not immediately perfect. Jesus works in us. The Holy Spirit works in us to, to make us more like him. But we continue to do sinful things. And when we do that, we again confess those things to God, asking for his forgiveness, and we continue following him. We keep going with the help of the Holy Spirit. But when we do sin, just like for Jeshua, Satan will be there accusing us before God. When we belong to God, because we put our trust in Jesus, though, he becomes our defense attorney. John, 1 John 2, 1. There we go. Dear children, I'm writing this to you so that you will not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate who pleads. An advocate is a defense attorney who pleads our case before the Father. He is Jesus Christ, the one who is truly righteous. Jesus will intercede for us when we have given him our lives by trusting him to rescue us because he's already interceded for us on the cross. Romans 8 also talks about this. 
Who dares accuse us whom God has chosen for his own? No one, for God himself has given us a right standing with himself. Who then will condemn us? No one, for Christ Jesus died for us and was raised to life for us. And he is sitting in the place of honor at God's right hand, pleading for us. This is exactly what Jesus did for Jeshua here in the book of Zechariah. And he intercedes for us as well, is what all that is saying. And then, just as Je like Jesus commands us, he commanded Jeshua to follow him. To follow him in right living, verses 6 and 7. Then the angel of the Lord spoke very solemnly to Jeshua and said, This is what the Lord of heaven's army says. If you follow my ways and carefully serve me, then you will be given authority over my temple and its courtyards, and I will let you walk among the others standing here. So now that Jeshua has been cleansed of his sin, he is ready to do what God has called him to do, to be the high priest for the people of Israel. Now that would be pretty encouraging for him to know that he is forgiven, and also knowing that the temple, which they are in the midst of rebuilding, would be completed, because he said that you will be the priest of that temple. So Jeshua is encouraged to follow God's ways and serve him. To follow is the natural result of being made clean by Jesus. And it's just as true for us. Ephesians 2, uh, 8-10 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. As you can see from those verses, our being saved from the penalty of sin is a gift of God through Jesus. We can't work for it because we're unable to contribute in any way to our salvation because we can't get rid of our burden of guilt by anything we do. God has to pluck us from the fire just like he did Jeshua, like that stick analogy there. But when we then belong to God, we are his workmanship. And it says we're created to do good things, which he's prepared, which he's designed for each of us to do. Although the good things we do can't make us right with God, it's his free gift to us. After we are saved, God has lots of good things that he wants us to do. Our, our, our lives will be different. God changes us. For Jeshua, God had designed him to be the high priest. But even for him, just like every one of us, God wants us to faithfully follow everything that he has given us in his word to do. The angel of the Lord also said to him, he says, I will let you walk among those standing here. Right at the end of that verse there. I will let you walk among the others standing here. Well, where, where is that? Well, in the presence of the angel of the Lord, Jesus. Basically, be with him in heaven. In the same, in the same way, our lives of following God is the visible proof of our trust, of our faith in Jesus. As we follow him faithfully, God promises we will be with him in heaven as well. We don't go to heaven because we do good works. But those good works show we have been cleansed by Jesus. If we aren't following God with our actions, basically if there's nothing visible in our lives that shows that God is changing us, then we need to consider if we have been cleansed by Jesus. Because the Holy Spirit doesn't leave his people alone. He will change them. He will change us. For Jeshua, God had made him high priest. And also to be symbols of things to come, as we see in verse 8. And those symbols are to be a servant and to be something called the branch. Verse 8 here. Listen to me, O Jeshua the high priest, and all you other priests. You are symbols of things to come. Soon I'm going to bring my servant, the branch. Now these symbols that he's talking about, the, the term servant and branch, were both well known to the people of Israel. These were messianic prophecies from the book of Isaiah. In other words, prophecies telling of the coming Messiah, the promised ruler and savior of Israel. And God says to Jeshua that he is a symbol of the things to come. He was told in verse 7 to serve, and in Zechariah chapter 6, which we're going to get to in a few weeks, Jeshua is even given this title of branch. He's given that title. And yet these prophecies were well known to be referring to the Messiah. 
This, isn't refer- this is not referring to Jeshua as the Messiah because it's explained he's a symbol, but not the real thing to come. If you want to look at those prophecies of the servant, for instance, um, you can look in, uh, they're in your notes. Uh, Isaiah 42, 49, 52, and 53 from Isaiah. And for the branch, basically uh, Zechariah 6 and Isaiah chapter 11. So if you want to look at those later, those are in your notes there. So he's saying Jeshua is a symbol of the Messiah because of his high priestly service, because he's a servant. He was the one who offered up regular sacrifices in the temple to remove the sin of the people. Jesus uh, completely, once for all, removes our sin when he dies on the cross as his sacrifice for us. Jeshua is also the symbol of the branch, who is distinctly a ruling king. You'll see that if you look at any of those uh, verses there. Uh, High priests were not to be kings, and kings were not to be high priests. They were from the wrong families. Priests were from the tribe of Levi, and kings were from the tribe of Judah, from David's family. And there were a few kings, if you, if, you, if you remember back in the book of Kings and stuff like that, that tried to do priestly things, and God said, no way, that's not your place. And they got into big trouble for it. But God is setting Jeshua as a ruler, along with Zerubbabel, over Israel at that time. And we're going to see this later again in Zechariah 6. And you see, Jesus is also known in the New Testament as both our high priest and as a king in the book of Hebrews. And I'm going to talk about that more when we get to Zechariah 6. So he's a symbol, basically, of that. A symbol of the Messiah who is to come, a symbol of Jesus. So that soon to come, the servant and the branch is actually Jesus himself. And just like he removed the stain of sin from Jeshua... In this next verse, he says he's going, to do, he's going to remove the stain of sin for the whole of the people of Israel. Zechariah chapter not, verse 9. He says to Jeshua, Now look at the jewel I have set before Jeshua, a single stone with seven facets. I will engrave an inscription upon it, says the Lord of heaven's armies, and I will remove the sins of this land in a single day. Now, the first part of that verse is is actually kind of confusing. We're not really even totally certain what the jewel is representing um, with its facets, um, nor are we even told what the inscription uh, says. But the last part of the verse can definitely be understood as referring to the crucifixion of Jesus. It's the only thing it could even be referring to. God permanently took care of the sin of all of God's people in a single day when Jesus died on the cross. When people receive that forgiveness and cleansing from God by putting their trust in Jesus, he gives peace between us and God. No war, no animosity, no guilt that needs payment through death. We have peace with God. And in our last verse, verse 10, that peace is spoken of in a figurative kind of a way, like we're living at peace in our land. And on that day, says the Lord of heaven's armies, each of you will invite your neighbor to sit with you peacefully, under your own grapevine and fig tree. The picture of what you have there is us sitting peacefully in the shade on a hot day, just like you would on any days like today, with our neighbors around us, with nothing to worry about, nothing to fear from God, and we have all the provision we need. That kind of peace we have with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Notice it says that we invite our neighbors to join us. Of course, God inspects us to invite those around us, those people who don't know Jesus, to find peace that can be had through Jesus as well. Now, if you remember, this whole thing that we've been reading in chapter 3, verses 1 to 10, was a vision that Zechariah, that God gave to to Zechariah the prophet. The, The real guy, Jeshua, in real life, didn't see any of that stuff. But he would have been told all of that by the prophet Zechariah. Think how encouraging that would be if, so, if you heard from God that, for instance, this same situation happened to you. You know, you were in the presence of God, you were filthy, and God says, no, and Satan's accusing you, and he says, take off those filthy clothes, and you are now righteous with Jesus, the righteousness of Jesus. That would be very encouraging for Zechariah to hear those things, to know that God has forgiven him and commissioned him to do the work of the high priest. At the same time, it's an encouragement to us because it's such a vivid picture 
of what Jesus does for every one of his followers as well. Because every one of us has an adversary, Satan, who will accuse us before God when we sin. But because Jesus cleansed us from our sin through the death on the cross and his resurrection when we turn from our sin and put our trust in him, okay, Jesus says, I have taken away your sins. And to Satan, he says, I, the Lord, reject your accusations. If God didn't tell us that Satan was accusing people, if we didn't see that in the Bible, we wouldn't have any idea that that kind of thing was going on ever or that is even happening now. But it is a good warning for us that that is going on so we don't take sin too lightly on our part. Remember, our sins are like those filthy clothes, those poop-covered clothing like, Zechari- like, uh, not Zechari- like Jeshua had. And it cost God hugely to come himself to pay for our sins on the cross. Just like in this vision, Jesus clothed Jeshua with clean garments. So we too are made completely clean through Jesus Christ. And just as Jesus, sorry, commissioned Jeshua with certain specific jobs to do, he was the high priest. So we also have good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them, like Ephesians 2.10 said. And also like Jeshua, God promises life in heaven with him in eternity. We have so much to thank God for. We can remind ourselves of these truths every day because we so easily forget them. And so do that. Remember, um, one of the, one of the uh, teachers at Miller College said a lot, preach the gospel to yourself every day. Tell yourself the gospel, what Jesus did for you. Remember, because every day we sin, every day we fail, we have to always come to him and say, please forgive me and thank you that you have that you have clothed me in your righteousness. When we remember what he's done for us, we want to follow him. We want to serve him as he asks us to. So let's go out and do that this week. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for what you did in this picture. uh, Such a vivid picture of this high priest who is clothed in this filthy garments and was being accused rightly before you and you said no way i have rescued this person and then you take that that filth away and he is clothed in your own righteousness thank you that you do that for every one of us who will put our trust in you thank you that i am not clean because i'm such a good person i am only clean because you have given me your righteousness and clothed me in that so i can stand before you and i can serve you and i can follow you thank you for that truth Father, whatever you have taught us here today, each and every one of us, help us to be obedient to it and do it. So we are so thankful to you. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.